and we are we're working through chapter one. We are taking our time. I am taking my time. Um, we're going to take we're going to chase a little bit of a rabbit tonight because we're we're going to talk about the subject of depression. And we're not I don't I don't know how far we'll get. Um, I'm not going to do a extensive series on it, but it is a very relevant topic today for a lot of reasons. And we're here in Second Corinthians. And I, I would remind you about verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be, the, be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Now, as you read that, uh, we think in terms of the Apostle Paul and, and us as believers enjoying the comfort of God. He's the Father of mercies and the Father of all comfort, but he's also the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his darkest hour, in his struggle, he enjoyed the comfort of the Father until the ultimate separation took place on the cross. But they had communion and they had fellowship leading right up to that event. And so it's a, it's a marvelous thing to look at the God of all comfort. And here, here in first century, uh, the Roman Empire, the believers as the dispensation of grace gets going and the, the time there, um, God was sufficient. And God's comfort and his strength was there for the believer. And so we're going to look at that this, this evening. And Paul is going to give a personal example. Um, he's talked about the, the fact that God comforts him in all, his tri in all their tribulation. And that's Paul and Timothy as they're traveling together and others at times. Uh, comforts us in all our tribulation. And Paul had a long list. That, chapter, that, that, that list in chapter 11. Um, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Those are two blanket statements. Paul says, all my trouble and all the trouble that, um, that the people I know going through. Jesus Christ and God the Father can meet the need, can come along and, 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 and comfort one another to provide strength, to, prov to provide a fortress, a place to a, a quiet, safe space. But not for the outer man, because the outer man perishes. The outer man's in a world of, of total chaos. But the real issue is peace and spiritual life that now is available to the Gentiles. What an amazing thing. Israel was offered new covenant life. They never fully saw it. Uh, that, that awaits the future time in their kingdom. But imagine God now offering comfort, personal relationship to the dogs, to the Gentiles, to his enemies. It's a marvelous thing. And 2 Corinthians lays that out in, in so many ways. He says in verse 5, the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation always also aboundeth by Christ. There is, an, there is an appropriate corresponding need for every situation. And it's not just a minimal need, it's an abundant need, a super abundant need. Um, it's marvelous. And his affliction in verse 6, as he goes through that, those things, it's, it enables him to communicate those things to, to others. And uh, Paul was optimistic because he knew by personal experience, verse 7, our hope of you is steadfast, knowing, I'm confident, he says, that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. So there's, uh, there's always an appropriate need there if you know how to access it, if you know what to expect. We need to have the right and the proper expectations of life, of life and time here, and um, recognizing that is critical. So he, he starts in verse 8. Did anybody look at Acts chapter 19 and the assignment that I gave you last week? <laughs> to, uh, to, it's, it's really kind of an odd passage, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time, but when he says in verse 8, For we would not, brethren have you to be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. It's kind of funny. He says, I don't want you guys to be ignorant of the trouble we had. Then he doesn't tell you what the trouble was. <laughs> he doesn't spell out the specifics of, of, of what actually happened. We read the event in Acts chapter 19, the riot at Ephesus. Go back, go back over there. Um, Acts chapter 19, we read about the riot, but Paul is an observer. The, the, the real trouble happens to his friends. And, uh, and, and Paul is off doing something else, and the, and, and the trouble erupts, and his friends are dragged into the, the amphitheater 
Paul finds out about it and he says, well, I better go stand with them. And he's actually stopped. He's stopped by some of his friends and some of the believers there that say, no, it's, it's too, it's too um, volatile. You go in and none of you might come out. And he was even stopped by some of the authorities who had respect for him. As you read the event here, Acts 19 is, is kind of the final, last hurrah, <laughs> if you will, of Paul's Acts ministry traveling. It's his third journey. We're studying Acts in Sunday school, and the first journey is in Acts 13 and 14. The second journey is chapter 16 to 18. And, and now he's, on, he's on the, on traveling the third time, heading to Jerusalem with the offering, and has this tremendous ministry, three years in Asia. Uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 1, it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. There's already some believers there, um, some, little, some Jewish believers there because there's a synagogue. But Aquila and Priscilla have been there and have been establishing ministry. They have a church in their house that has, that has blossomed into a ministry. And it becomes kind of the, the home base for Paul for three years of ministry. If you look at verse 8, uh, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things con per concerning the kingdom of God. Here's his ministry in the Jewish synagogues to the Jew first. Um, and he's engaging there. Um, verse 19, there's opposition. So he leaves, um, goes to another place, a place called the School of Tyrannus. Verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which, are, which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now that's ministry not just in Ephesus, but that's fruit from the ministry in Ephesus that's scattered throughout the region. That's Colossae, that's Laodicea, that's Miletus, that's whole region if you look on a map. In two years, Paul blanketed that area and, and his followers blanketed that area. So you got three months, you got two years, then you have, you have a reaction in Ephesus in verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 where uh, Paul casts out a demonic spirit and um, they have this, this book burning um, where in verse 18 and 19 where the folks gather and burn their, their witchcraft and their sorcery books and, and all of their, um, their idolatrous stuff. Verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You have, you have three big statements here about fruit. Um, you have in verse 10, all they which in Asia heard. Verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. As the riot breaks out, verse 26, the, uh, the silversmiths say, moreover you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. No handmade gods are worthy. And what you, you see the reaction here at Ephesus and the, and the region, and it's cutting into the economy of the, of the silversmiths, the little making the, the silver idols for the, the goddess Diana. Her temple was one of the, one of the uh, seven wonders of the world at the time. It was uh, many, many years in building, and it was a sexual worship. Um, the Diana, the goddess of fertility, and all those other things, they're a perverted thing. Um, but Paul has this tremendous ministry here, and the backlash spills out as these silversmiths say, hey, they're cutting into our economy, and Paul is, is the, the, the temple of the great goddess Diana is at risk. But, it's, but they, they say it's their, their income first. <laughs> so it's the money before it's the quote-unquote religion and the truth there, but tremendous heathenism. So um, the, the riot breaks out. Paul wants to go in. He's hindered. Um, verse um, 32, Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. There you see mob action. When you get a massive group of people together, uh, sometimes the, the crowd just feeds on itself. And you see that there. Verse, 20, verse 33, they knew Diana is at the center of the controversy, and they drew Alexander, verse 33, out of the multitude. The Jews 
putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one, of, with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And it's, it's a little bit awkward, but evidently what happened is, the, is this great temple of the goddess Diana is, is being questioned and influence and attendance is down and the Jews don't, Paul is, is considered the, the, the problem and the Jews don't want to be linked with Paul. They, 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 they bring Alexander and Alexander is, is, a, is a Jewish believer of some kind of note and he's basically going to say hey Paul we got nothing to do with Paul it's not not us he's going to make his defense don't accuse us and when they found out he was a Jew the, the, the crowd just blows up what you see there is is Israel would rather defend an Ital a, a heathen Italian God from persecution than be identified with the Apostle Paul it's a it's a it's a strange thing uh, but again, you see an indication of, of who Israel is. And um, so the, the riot carries on. And then one of the, one of the um, dignitaries, one of the, the diplomats, one of the governors or the elders, tries to quiet the crowd, says there's really no legal action we can take here. Go home. Shut up and go home. And verse 40, 41, when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. In verse, chapter 20, verse 1, after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him certain disciples and embraced them and departed. He leaves Ephesus. So Paul talks about this trouble in Asia with three years of ministry, but we're really not told what the problem was. What we're told, we're, we're told in Luke, the, the events and what triggered it. In Corinthians, we're told how it affected Paul. And it affected him to the point that he despaired even of life. So what was the problem? We don't know. Um, verse 29, the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. So they grabbed two of Paul's friends and dragged them into the middle of this mob. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. So perhaps... The trouble at Asia was this riot, and perhaps his friends were abused in the midst of the crowd. That's why Paul was not allowed to go in. Maybe he's watching his friends persecuted and, uh, or beaten, and Paul is heartbroken about, here's, here's this ministry that I have, and it's okay, they go after me, but now my friends are having to pay a price for this truth. Maybe that's the, the issue. Um, go over to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul was there for three years. We're not told everything that he did. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Maybe Paul was put into an arena with a bunch of other believers who lost their life you know the, the 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 lions, you know, thrown to the lions, and so on. The spectacle of the of the the entertainment of the day. We don't know. Um, maybe Paul's life was in jeopardy here, and um, but we're not even told when he fought with beasts at Ephesus. Um, so we we don't know. But go go to First Corinthians. Let's go back over there or Second Corinthians now. That's a little bit of the background. Paul says, "I don't want you to be ignorant of 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 the trouble that we had." But he doesn't tell them what it is. And you know why that is? Because it's up to the believers for 2,000 years to fill in the blank. <laughs> you know, he's just said in verse 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, comforted us in all of our tribulation. Fill in the blank, <laughs> your life compared to Paul's. And we can comfort them which are in any trouble. The point of the passage here is that there is an abundance of comfort and strength. Whatever comes our way in life. And it's comfort by Jesus Christ. You know why, be, why it's by Jesus Christ? Because his life is within. We not only receive eternal life, that is, heaven one day, but we receive his life. God puts his life within to strengthen, to encourage, to fellowship. You know, when, when, uh, when, when we pray, 
you know, people pray like this, but you can talk to the very presence of God himself inside. Now, yes, Jesus Christ in actuality is at the right hand of the Father, but aren't we also at the right hand of the Father in him? What a glorious position. So it's a, it's a, it's a double, you know, it's not just this, and it's not just this, but there's personal communion and strength to be enjoyed as this life develops and grows from within through sound doctrine. And that's why you have a teaching ministry in the local church. So, verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you to be ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength. So there's the outward, the, the, the magnitude of whatever it was that happened, above strength. I, I had no resources to cope in so much that we despaired even of life. The despair there is depression, discouragement, at a loss. I quit. I'm tired. It's too much. I don't want to go on. I don't want to go forward. And it's the, the great apostle here experienced depression and discouragement. And then he says we, that we had this, verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raises the dead. Now people read that and automatically think that it's physical deliverance that Paul got here. Uh, the, 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 the end result of the trouble was despair. And I think the, the, being, the, the raising the dead is the resurrection life. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Go to Romans 6. I don't remember if we looked at this last time or not. But this is where the, 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 the Romans lays a foundation and Galatians and Corinthians expand and explain. Ephesians lays a foundation and Philippians and Colossians expand and explain and illustrate. Romans 7, as Paul talks about living the Christian life he, and our, our, our union with Christ, being dead to sin, being baptized into his death. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Christ's resurrection life, his association with sin, his separation from God is over with. And now he has a restored relationship with the Father. For if we, verse 5, have been planted together. See that oneness over and over again. With him and together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might dis be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. If we be dead with him, we believe that we shall also live with him. He's not talking about living with him in heaven. He's talking about living with him right here and now in the resurrection life and identity that a, that a believer in Jesus Christ and member of the body of Christ has. We have new life, new identity, new capacity, new way of thinking and approaching. And he says in Galatians, the cross of Jesus Christ crucifies me to the world and, and the world unto me. <laughs> And I'm crucified with him, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so this issue of the resurrection life, it's internal deliverance in the midst of the circumstances. Now, God kept him alive, no doubt about it, because he's still got some books to write. He's still got some things to do. But he was an apostle. You and I are not an apostle. This is the Acts period. There are unique things happening here to special people. We don't reach the norm of the dispensation of grace till Paul's prison epistles. But go back to go back to 2 Corinthians. So this, this issue of, of de deliverance, we had the verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Why? That purpose, intent, we should not trust in ourselves. 
these things come upon us that we that we come to the end of ourself and our resources he says in chapter 12 that in our weakness his strength is made perfect there is a there is a unpleasant fact that has eternal blessing and deep blessing associated with it and the treasure is in an earthen vessel the the vessel is is deteriorating and dissolving but there's e eternal internal life that's growing and so he says we just we were we had this happen to us and it, it's all part of the learning process Paul is learning these things too. Even though he has special revelation and God is communicating these wonderful truths to him, he's learning how they, how they, how they transfer into, into energy and, and substance in his life. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. That we should not trust in ourselves. I mean, isn't that how you get saved? You come to the end of yourself and you say, Lord, I can't do it. I can't measure up. I can't uh, achieve eternal life I just gotta I can't trust in, it's not a works lest any man should boast I'm going to trust what you did for me the Christian life is the same way as you received Christ Jesus the Lord not by works that you do but by trusting in him so walk ye in him rooted and built up and established in the faith so it's not trust in ourselves but in God see the issue is faith you know where, where, where truth becomes life when we believe it. When the Word of God is believed, that's when it becomes life. When you believe the gospel of your salvation, that's what imparts life to you. The Christian life. It's the issue of faith and truth in the doctrine becoming a reality in the way you think and, and in the way you view life and the way you view yourself. Not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us Here's the deliverance. There's a past deliverance, delivered us from so great a death. We got through that problem. <laughs> and doth deliver. I'm enjoying this life right here and now as I'm traveling and as I'm, as I'm ministering as we're, as we're heading in your direction. Um, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. You see the three tenses? Past, he did it present he's doing it now and I know whatever's on the horizon I'm going to have provision that I'm going to have that comfort that's going to deliver me not physically but deliver me emotionally from despair and discouragement there's another verse like it go over to the book of Philippians there is a, there's an amazing there, there's a parallel there's some subtle parallels between the book between the Corinthian epistles and the book of Philippians both are epistles of reproof and correction. Doctrine, reproof, correction. Romans is doctrine, reproof, correction in Galatians and Corinthians, Corinthians and Galatians. Ephesians is doctrine, Philippians reproof and there's there, there's a parallel just on a different level. In Philippians, Paul is a prisoner. He's already been at Rome, the book of Acts is concluded and he's suffering in Rome as a prisoner. He says in verse 18, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, and will rejoice. Paul's joy was that the message was getting out that would deliver and save individuals. And he says, he's a prisoner, and he says, For I know, verse 19, that this shall turn to my salvation. What's the this? It's Christ being preached. It's the ministry. It's the truth getting out. This shall turn to my salvation. Paul's already saved, isn't he? <laughs> He's, he what's the salvation? It's joy. Philippians is the epistle of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. It's Paul's a prisoner here. He's a pawn in the, in the Roman system. And it sounds like he's on the mountaintop <laughs> when you read the epistles uh, of, of Philippians. I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. What's going to deliver him? The mighty hand of God that's going to break open the prison? 
No, the Spirit of God. Where's the Spirit of God? Works inside through the Word of God. Brings the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. You know what joy is? Joy is not happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Joy is a deeper sense of meaning and depth of life that goes beyond just something happening and the issue of joy, um, you, you, you go further in, in chapter 1, Paul writes to the Philippians in verse 28, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation. See, the Philippians were suffering. And their enemies just look at it and says, you guys are getting what you deserve. <laughs> you know, a bunch of oddballs, you know, radicals, you know, um, you know, this sect is everywhere spoken about. Um, but if you, your suffering is a token to you of salvation. For unto you, verse 29, it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to, to do what? Yeah. Suffer. Having the same conflict which you saw in me. What did they see in Paul in Philippi? Remember what happened at Philippi back in the book of Acts? He was stripped naked in the public square, beaten with rods, and then his back was bloodied, and he was thrown into the, into the inner prison there. And what he says there is you guys have the, you have the same suffering that you saw in me. Now you're suffering too. And, he, and now here to be in me. Paul is suffering he says, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. And what's the issue in Philippians? The issue is joy in suffering. Strength. It's the God of all comfort. The peace of God which passes all understanding. I can't explain it to you. <laughs> There's a dynamic to it that you experience by faith. An internal strength. An internal relationship and comfort that, uh, that is abundant in any situation, in any trial, and it's a resource for you, and it's a resource to share with others. What a glorious thing. Go back to, I said I was going to talk about depression. Let's, let's, let's get to that. Go to, and this is, this is where the rabbit's going to come in a little bit. Um, depression is real. The blues, the discouragement, we all have ups and downs in life. We all re react and respond to different things. And that's the ultimate emotional reaction. Depression and discouragement is, is emotional revolt. It's your feelings of, of, of sadness and gloom and lack of optimism that just take over and dominate your thinking. And he says it back in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9, uh, we despaired even of life. The issue of despair, depression, discouragement, the issue of your heart, your belief system, your values, your, 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 your strength. Go with me to the book of Proverbs. Um, it's how you think about things that make a difference. Proverbs chapter 15 I tell you, I've been reading the book of Proverbs more lately. And there's all these little nuggets there that just crystallize in a, in a sentence something that's going on in life or something that you see in society. And it's marvelous. Here's a, here's a marvelous principle. Proverbs chapter 15, verse um, 13. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. A merry heart, verse 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a what? A continual feast. It's your heart attitude that makes a difference. You know, in all of the, what you focus on in life, what gets... You know, we all have trouble from time to time falling asleep because you get thinking about stuff or you get, you get uh, concerned about something. And what you focus on, what, what dominates your thinking, affects your outlook, affects your countenance. Um, it affects physically your body. Proverbs 17, 
Um, in verse 11, I believe it is, 17 verse 22. Turn over there. Proverbs 17 verse 22. Um, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Um, you see, there's a, there's a physical connection to the way your body responds to the, to the heart attitude and the inner man. Um, a broken spirit dryeth the bones, a merry heart's good like a medicine. I think that's more than just a figure of speech. I think when we get out of sorts and worry and depression and discouragement and anger and bitterness and all those other things, it affects you physically. It does. So better off focusing on things that don't upset you and anger. You, you, we have to deal with them, right? But focusing on them and consumed by it, it'll eat you alive. And we get caught up with the, with the with political stuff and the, you know, HR1 and, and executive orders and the economy and and, 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 and it can mess people up. And yeah, do we have to deal with it? Should we know what's going on? Should we be aware? Absolutely. Um, deal with people and, and try to influence, sure. But don't be consumed with stuff. Um, depression, discouragement. Um, whatever happens, the real issue is what? How do we respond to it? How do we, what's the mental attitude? And what does Paul teach us in the book of Romans? Um, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience patience experience and experience hope the issue of of not glorying for the tribulation but in it that little word in is key your attitude makes all the difference in the world if you're if you can rejoice you can try you can try to plow through it if there's something deeper in your life that that floats your boat and drives your Tahoe <laughs> or your or your Toyota or whatever it is you drive um, that's that's the issue. Uh, mental, block, mental block there. Um, that's the issue. How do we respond? Our focus in life. What we give our mind to, consumed by or dwell on. Depression is a result of wrong thinking over an extended period of time that begins to become habitual and become, begins to become the the. The, the norm of what you think upon when you get up in the morning as you're, as you're facing life. And over time, that becomes, it, it turns to bitterness, it can turn to anger, or it can turn to discouragement. And just drive you down to the point, why go on? Man, it's just, you know, um, it's a, it's a doggy, it's, it's, it's a rat race out there and the rats are winning. You know, and we just have the, you know, the, the, I'm just going to get through the day kind of thing. Or we can have the right and the proper thinking that, um, and depressions is just your emotions and your feelings taking over. Your emotions are meant to be responders. You are meant to function biblically on the basis of your mind, your heart, and then your body. The world turns it just the opposite. It's the lust of the flesh. It's whatever makes me happy in my emotions. And if it's right or wrong and how I think about it, doesn't matter. God set us up to function on the basis of truth and his word. And so it's the issue of your mind and your thought process and then your heart and your will choosing to think about it by faith based on divine viewpoint. And you know when you do that, your emotions then follow responding and rejoicing in truth. But if you live your life under the dominion of your emotions and your feelings, your emotions and your feelings are what? They're a roller coaster. They're constantly up and down and, and uh, um, at the women call of, of, of events and circumstances. Depression is wrong thinking over an extended period of time and the process, as if it goes on long enough, ultimately people snap. Or they just decline and nosedive and go deeper and deeper and deeper into that pit. And sometimes you, get, you can't get people out. 
and your emotions and your your thinking and the chemical imbalance and all that stuff if it's if it's in one cycle constantly all the time it becomes so deeply ingrained that you that and and people try to treat it with drugs and i understand the emotional and the 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 the, the different things that happen and you try to you try to uh, uh, minimize some of the extremes but sometimes you just you can never snap them out of it and i've seen two examples here recently in the last five seven eight years of people uh, one I had direct contact with a, a, a great believer but he always constantly struggled with things and eventually it got him because when he drifted into that 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 place where I've never seen him before it was just his normal attitude and the things he constantly talked about magnified and you couldn't get him off it was like a broken record and you couldn't get them out of it. And um, th those things happen. Whatever it is, whether it's society and the world, um, there's, there's, two, there's two basic elements. And I haven't read all these psychological books, so I can't tell you. You know, there might be other things. But I've broken depression down into two categories. There is personal, the personal cause and struggle, the mental and psychological things that come to bear that that consume us or there's circumstantial depression just the pressure the, the pressure of life finally over being overwhelmed by the responsibility by the obligations by the problem by the by the physical illness by the responsibility for somebody else for life and family there are the mistreatment that co that comes at us as we're out there in the world on the job or wherever um, both of those things can bring about depression the personal side, um, self-esteem, the personal image, the self-condemnation that happens. Come over to Romans chapter number 7. Paul dealt with this too. What we're looking at in Corinthians, the trouble at, uh, at Ephesus was a circumstantial thing that came upon him that then produced an emotional reaction. But... Um, Romans chapter 7, we all struggle with personal feelings of self-esteem of, uh, of, uh, or, or self-condemnation or a low personal image. And what, it focus, what, it, what, what winds up happening, it's the I problem. You're too self, not self-centered, maybe self-centered, but self-focused. I and me. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul refers to himself 40 times here. The personal struggle with himself. Romans 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. You know, just a list of do's and don'ts don't fix your problems. He says, because there's, there's an internal problem that I have. For, what I, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. It's, you know, that, that circular talk there. I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. <laughs> and I'm always falling short. This is the self-condemnation. You know what that is? That's legalism. That's the issue of the law and the performance. It not, it's not the Ten Commandments and you're trying to achieve. It's you applying legalistic thinking to yourself. If I can just do X, Y, and Z, then I'll be, I'll be proud of myself and I'll be accomplishing something. The problem is eventually, if I, if I can do then, what do you eventually do? You always hit the wall. <laughs> the treadmill doesn't work. Um, verse 16, if then... I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. The law, it's not the I'm I want to do good things. I got the right standard, but how to perform? <laughs> he says, now, verse 17, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Do you see that phrase, it is no more I? Does that remind you of something that's up here in the building somewhere? Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 not I but Christ do you see how Paul separates himself 
from his nature it's I, I sin now then it is no more I it's not the real me that's doing it what's doing it sin that dwells in me is where I fail okay he separates himself from his old sin nature and you know who the real the real us is it's Christ it's the new creature it's the new identity that we now have but Paul he's 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 reflecting back this is what I was doing I was focused on myself and I came to the realization hey that's that that missing the mark that's not me that's the old sin nature that I got that I, I can't get rid of he says verse 18 for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what no good thing for the will is present with me I know what I should do <laughs> but how to perform that which is good I find not I know what I'm supposed to do and I get there some of the time but I can't conquer it why because I got sin in me I got that old sin nature and what we do is we focus on the I can't instead of the who I am now in Christ as a new creature he says verse 19 for the good that I would I do not but the evil which I would not that I do same thing now if I do that I would not here it is again it is no more I that do it but sin that dwelleth in me don't define yourself by your failures grace lets you look at your failures and say that's the old sin nature that's who I was in Adam that's what I came into this world with but that's not who I am now who am I now I'm a saint of the most high God I love doing that to people I got a phone call from a guy today and I says hello Saint Jack and he kind of chuckled because he's not used to hearing that we need to think of ourselves as more than a sinner saved by grace no that's just looking back at the at the original problem we're a saint saved by grace act like it live in the identity of who you are now don't wallow in the mud of who you were when you came into this world I find then a law verse 21 it's like the law of gravity the law of gravity always wins unless you're in the, in the challenger <laughs> and then you know yeah. You, know, you know how you conquer the law of gravity? With a greater law, the law of reaction or, and reaction or whatever it is, you know, the physics, yeah. All that stuff I didn't learn because I was bored silly in high school. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. There's the law of gravity always bringing me down. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members there's this struggle going on inside and it's constant verse 24 oh wretched man that I am <laughs> that's, that's that self loathing I'm just no good I don't measure up I'm not what so and so is um, I got some other things to look at but time has kind of slipped away you know this really gets down to where life is lived isn't it um, and what grace is more than just hey Paul's epistles here compared to prophecy and rightly dividing the word grace is a way of thinking it's a way of thinking with yourself and it's a way of thinking and dealing with others based on how God deals with you <laughs> so you know what we better understand how God's grace applies to us because the gap is far greater between us and God <laughs> than it is between us and somebody else and God looks at us and he deals with us we are forgiven we are justified we are accepted why because we if we <laughs> do you know get over the hump no because we trusted Jesus Christ and were put taken from Adam a sinner of this world and put in his son and given his life and his identity and now that's where we you know if you stand there can you look at your life now and be honest yeah I made a mess <laughs> look at that <laughs> happened again 
but that's not who I am. You step back, you look at why and how, and, where, and you make adjustments, and you go on. The self-loathing, oh, woe, woe is me, and oh, poor me, and so on, all that does is feed the beast of your old sin nature. That's the law. And that's why the law and religion and just do's and don'ts, it's godliness but with no power. The power comes from grace and that inner life in us in Christ. I'll give you one, one more thing. I knew we weren't going to get, I got a bunch of stuff so we'll talk more about this next time. But this is practical stuff. I tell you, I, I learned the hard way washing windows. I'm a, I, can, I can clean a plate glass window with my eyes closed. Um, but when I started out, I was I was horrible at it, and oh man, I can't, you know, and and it finally I, you have to be patient with yourself, you know that, and because uh, God's patient with. I'll give you this verse. Go to Second Corinthians chapter ten, and we'll quit. We always compare ourselves with somebody else. Boy, they got it together, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't see them on Sunday morning when they're running around the house trying to get ready for church. You see them. <laughs> you see the end product, right? Second um, Corinthians chapter ten. I love this verse, verse twelve. He says, "We dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves." What are the last three words? Are not wise. The, co the comparing of yourself to other people and looking at them and they got it all together and if I could just be like that, <laughs> that's the wrong comparison. He says it's not wise. If it's not wise, what is it? It's foolish. It's self-defeating. And it, you, know what the, you know where the problem is? There's, there's a lot of themselves in that verse. The problem is you're too self-focused. And the more you look at yourself, the easier it is to get depressed. But you look at yourself and you evaluate yourself in Christ. You can be honest, see yourself the way God sees you. He sees you in his son. He, doesn't, he sees you holy and without blemish. Fancy that. Um, your sin and your failure disappoint, disappoint him. We grieve the spirit of God. But his faithfulness is there. You have a perfect and complete standing in God's grace. You know why? Because all that stuff's been paid for on the cross. <laughs> that's the simplicity of the gospel that's just wonderful. It clears the deck, wipes away all the junk, and puts his righteousness and gives it to you in its place. And now you stand there. Think and evaluate your life starting from that point, not back, not in the gutter. Don't be the homeless guy that, that won the lottery and goes back to living in the cardboard box just because that's the way you've always done it. If you win the lottery, what does the homeless guy do? He buys himself a new house and he, he starts a new life and a new identity. Too many times we go back and we live in the poverty of the, uh, of the old life and the old mentality. And depression, one of the first causes, is your own self-loathing. And the, the woe is me, and I'm no good, and nobody loves me, and, and my identity is in other things other than Jesus Christ. You know what, Paul? Paul was beaten up and, and, and slandered and misrepresented uh, from day one by people who he, all he did was want to help. <laughs> And you know where he found comfort? In his identity in Christ. I'm a new creature. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll pick up on this thing about depression because I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, then there's the circumstantial side of life. Just the problems and the pressures that come our way. Some of them are out of our control. Nothing we can do about it. So what do we do? The, the issue is the attitude of how we respond to it. And a proper, a merry heart do with good like a medicine. And grace, God's grace is the answer there too. And you, But you operate on the basis of faith, not on the basis of, of emotion and sight. Amen? You have a question or a comment. Um, I, you know, that just gets me right where I live. Um, day in and day out, whether it's dealing with myself or other people, 
The answer is God's grace. Here, I ask for a question, then I keep talking. Richard. When you do your windows, because I've seen windows done a different way, you start where you go back yeah. and forth, back and forth. We'll yeah, we'll have, we'll have that conversation at a different time. Oh, okay. So I'd like to talk about the, the law principle there or questions about depression, but I can, I, I can give you a lesson. Huh? When you're suffering through depression, a lot of times you certainly turn to self-destruction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just the, the emotional aspect of depression. Yeah, you punish yourself. And, and you're, when, you, when you live with all of that stuff inside you, your health, it, it yeah. makes your health really bad. Yeah. Real bad. People go from beating themselves up emotionally because they're self-loathing to beating themselves up physically, and uh, it's a it's a it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle, and grace is the answer with yourself, and with others too. Good good observation. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the uh, the standing that we have in Christ Jesus. That as we lay the foundation of the Christian life. We understand first and foremost the issue of sins needing to be paid for. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and paid the debt of our sins. But Father, our problem goes deeper, deeper than just the things that we do. There's a root problem of a nature that, we, that we're born with because of the sin of Adam being passed on to all of his offspring. And Father, your grace provides for us new life to develop within to have victory over the nature that we receive from Adam. And Father, we thank you for that wonderful new identity and life that we have as a new creature. And Father, as we face life now, we face it with a renewed mind, not in the natural viewpoint of the flesh in the world, but divine viewpoint. And we do that by faith. We make a conscious choice to believe what you say about us and about life from a position of acceptance before you. And if you accept us, Father, we should accept ourselves, not in complacency, but just recognize who we are in your Son. We thank you so much for that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. That's a wrap. <laughs>